Good morning. Good to see so many people out this morning. This is a Memorial Day weekend. So the theme for this morning and this evening is that of memorial and remembering Jesus' death and his sacrifice for us. I invite you to come back tonight as we talk about a lesson I've entitled In the Presence of the Lord as we look at some parallels and some similarities of the things found in the tabernacle and things that we can find in the church and things that we do in the church. And I invite you to come back tonight for that lesson. But this morning, we're going to talk about a lesson I've entitled from Romans 5, 6 to 10, The Day the World Saw God's Love. Tomorrow is the day set aside by our nation as Memorial Day. And it's more than just a time to have a day off. Most people enjoy a three, in some cases, four-day weekend. And it's more than just a time that we can enjoy burgers and hot dogs and time on the grill or time with family. While all those things are great and all those things are fine and fun to do, Memorial Day was set up as citizens of the United States to remember the fallen soldiers who paid the ultimate sacrifice, who gave the fullest measure for our freedoms. It is a saying that says, all gave some, and some gave all. Saints recognize that freedom isn't free. For the Christian, this is an easy concept to recognize. We know that freedom isn't free. It has always, always, whether secularly or whether we look at our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, freedom has always been bought and paid for in blood. And Ephesians 1, 7 tells us we have forgiveness of sins through his blood. I have on the slide above me Revelation 1, 5. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. This morning and this evening, Kind of the theme is going to be running through is that of the memorial, the Lord's Supper. I really want to thank uh, Richard for the song selection he led us in singing and remembering those that sacrifice, remembering the Lord's body and his blood that was shed. I appreciate the words of Brother Jackson at the Lord's table, bringing us back to that Jesus himself directed us. This do in remembrance of me. We do it every first day of the, Lord, of the week. The Lord's Supper is a memorial that we partake every first day of the week. Tonight, we're going to spend a little more time talking about that idea of sharing in his body and sharing in his blood from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. But when we partake of the bread, when we partake of the fruit of the vine, we share in his body and his blood. We remember his death and his sacrifice till he comes again. How can we remember an event that we weren't there for? What is Jesus saying when he puts it in perpetuity, when he says, this do in remembrance of me? And then Paul says as often as you do this, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. By that, that remembrance is a memorial. Just as there have been memorials to people, great men and women of history, memorials to events and battles fought and won, battles fought and lost, we look at those memorials, even though we weren't there, we can somberly reflect on what that means. In this case, as we gather around the table, we somberly reflect what Jesus did for us. It can be said of Jesus, one gave all for all. And in fact, Hebrews 10 and verse 10 says, By this we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And another passage in Hebrews chapter 10 says, Once for all, for all time. Once for all time he gave his body that one time offering. And he simply asked us in Luke 22 verse 15, and Paul relates in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26, when you do these things, when you eat of the bread, when you eat of the cup, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. When we partake of this Lord's Supper, that knowledge of and that personal application to his death will make us obedient to his word. When we recognize that he died for me, we recognize he died for you. It ought to prompt us to do something. It strengthens our resolve to live faithfully to him and for to put him first and foremost in our lives. And so we partake of it every first day of the week to set the tone for the rest of the week. And the song we just sang, that he is crowned the Son of God. He is crowned love. He is crowned Son of Man. He is crowned Lord of Lords and King of Kings. We need to make him the Lord and King in our life. As we look in John chapter 3 and verse 16, a very familiar passage to us. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. 
That word gave encompasses so much. I want you to just think of just a few thoughts with me as you consider that little word gave. He was betrayed by one of his own and delivered to the people seeking his life. We read very early on in his ministry, they began looking for opportunities to kill him. And then one of his own colludes with them and says, I will find that opportunity. And so he conspires for money to betray him into their hands. Once that betrayal happens, and he is arrested in a spot well known to the, his betrayer, he appears before Annas and Caiaphas, the Sanhedrin, Herod, and finally Pilate. There before Pilate, the Roman, or the, the Roman governor over Judea, who knew and declared multiple times that Jesus was innocent, not deserving of any punishment whatsoever, has him scourged. Many historians contemporary of that time refer to the scourge as the intermediate death. Josephus describes an event where a father was forced to watch his son be scourged, and Josephus says the scourge would take the insides of a person and put them on the outside. And Pilate orders this innocent man to be scourged. And then sentenced to death and led to Calvary, bearing his own cross, finally crumbling under the weight of it. And a man, Simon of Cyrene, is pressed in the service to carry it and bear it the rest of the way. There he's led to Calvary. That's Latin for the Hebrew Golgotha. It means the place of the skull. But for Jesus, it meant crucifixion. For the thieves that were going to be crucified, one on each side of him, it meant death. Some people ask, why did Jesus have to die? Why did Jesus die on the cross? Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9 answers that for us. It tells us to taste death for everyone. And it's not talking about physical death. It's talking about the spiritual death. It's talking about so that those who are that die in the Lord, those who are saved by Christ, covered by his blood, their sins washed away, never have to, set, never have to be eternally separated from God. On that day, the world saw God's love pour out at the cross of Calvary, whether it recognized it or not. And we're going to read through Romans chapter 5, 6 to 10. And we're going to see that Paul reveals six things about the day the world saw God's love. Six things. We're going to talk about those six things. I plan for us to do that briefly. We'll see how that goes. But Romans 5, starting in verse 6. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we are reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. There are six things that Paul reveals about the day the world saw God's love. And as we pointed out, poured out on the cross at Calvary. So as we consider Romans chapter 5, 6 to 10, one of the first things is the plan of God for human redemption is spelled out there in verse 6. I want to bring your mind to something there. As we read verse 6, it says, For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. His death was planned by God. In fact, we can go to Acts chapter 2, 23 to 24. 1 Peter 1, 18 to 21, and find that God's plan was set in place from the beginning, before the foundation of the world. And Isaiah 53, 4 through 5, Isaiah speaks of this future event as if it had already taken place. I encourage you to go back and look in Isaiah 53 and look how that reads. It reads as if this is talking about history when it's talking about it happening in the future. So sure was God's word on this matter that Isaiah was able to write through the Spirit as if it had already taken place. God determined that his son should die for mankind as the perfect sacrifice. In many other places we can look at it in Hebrews 10, 14, 1 Peter 3, 18. He's called the just for the unjust. Those of us that were deserving of that death, deserving of that cross, deserving of that alienation from God, Jesus Christ became sin on our behalf. He took it. The next thing we see as we go through our text in Romans chapter 5, verse 6 and verse 8 is we're reminded of the sinfulness of man. It says, while we were still helpless at the right time, 
Christ died for the ungodly. We can go to Galatians 4.4 and see that when the fullness of time came, Christ came. So at the right time, this was in God's timing. But the reason was the sinfulness of man. In verse 8, But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ didn't die for the mankind after they had changed their ways. He died for mankind when they were helpless, when there was nothing they could do about it. He died for mankind when they were still in their sins, lost. Because the word of God was going to go not only to the Jew, but to the Gentiles as well. Those, as Ephesians 2 bears out, were outside of the commonwealth of Israel. They didn't even have the law of Moses. Now, they could have proselyted. They could have obeyed it. But the sinfulness of man is what put Jesus on the cross. And we'll talk about the reason he went to the cross in a little bit. But the spiritual illness is called ungodly. Jude 4 refers to this as ungodly. Ungodly simply means unlike God. If it's unlike God, then what is it like? Think about that. If our actions are ungodly, that is ungodlike, then it means it's like Satan. Sin means missing the mark. Romans 3.23 says, All men have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What is a transgression? We talk about transgressions today in, in the form of trespass. When someone trespasses, they have transgressed a boundary. Transgression simply means stepping over a fixed boundary. In the law of morality, in the law of God, sin is a transgression, stepping across God's fixed boundary. Ephesians 2, 4 through 5 describes this as a person that is dead in their sins, dwelling in darkness, walking according to the course of this world. Lawlessness, that is iniquity. 1 John 3, 4 tells us that one that is contrary to God's standards or laws, that means one outside of his righteousness, that is iniquity. And sin is lawlessness. That means missing the law of God. If sin is missing the mark, John describes it as iniquity lawlessness then it's missing the law of god the death of christ declares the tragedy of sin it tells us the ultimate price that had to be paid second corinthians 5 21 tells us the sinless son of god suffered because of man's sin untold agony that he bore in his body and shed in his own blood not for anything that he had committed but because of the sin of man sin put christ on the cross that's why he went. But that's not what held him there. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Sin is not just a mere social slight. Sin is rebellion against God. Sin is rebellion against God Almighty who created the heavens and the earth. He has set fixed boundaries. And when we transgress those boundaries, we have sinned. And Jesus Christ was the remedy for that sin. Second Thessalonians 1, 6-10 describes some of those consequences. That the wrath of God will fall on those who do not know God and those who have never obeyed the gospel. Those who remain outside that boundary will find themselves eternally separated from God, paying that penalty of eternity away from his presence. There in 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 9. The third thing we want to note from Romans 5, 6 to 10 is the inability of man to save himself. I want you to go back to verse 6. It says, For while we were still helpless... While we were still helpless, man is without strength to save himself when it comes to sin. The King James version of this reads, man was without strength. The New American renders it helpless. Man still on his own, his or her own is still helpless. Man is still without strength. Man could not be saved by works of the law of Moses. Paul makes this clear in Romans 3, 20 and verse 28. Titus chapter 3, 5, men could not be saved by their own good works. Romans 1, 16 to 17, tells us that Paul was not ashamed of the gospel, for in it is the power of God to save the Jew first and then also the Gentile or the Greek. It's not enough to be a good neighbor. It's not enough to be someone that is honest. It's not enough to be a good father or mother. It's not enough to call ourselves a good citizen. But we must be righteous. Because we read there in verse 17 of Romans 1 that in it is the righteousness of God and that the man of God must walk or live by faith. Some still believe that they can be saved on their own merit. We hear all the time, well, I don't need to obey the gospel. 
I'm a good, moral, upright person. Well, who defines what a moral, upright person is if not righteousness according to God? There are so many people that will hang their soul on the hook of being a good and decent person. And they will say, my grandmother, my mother, whatever it is, I don't need to obey the gospel because my parents, my grandparents never did and they were good, decent people. And so they're willing to go to the place that they don't want even their relative to go to. Think of the rich man in Luke chapter 16. They're being in torment. He said, just send Lazarus back from the dead. I have five brothers. I don't want them here. And he said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Today, we have Jesus and the apostles. Let them hear them. While we are still helpless, aptly describes the state of man apart from God. And the fourth thing is the condemnation of man. Look in verse 9. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. The wrath of God is going to fall on mankind. So there is a condemnation of man for sin. That word justify means to pronounce pardon or forgiveness of sin. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, pardoned, set free in his blood, Prior to justification, there is condemnation. God sent his son to save a condemned world. We see this in John 3 and verse 17. Right after saying he sent his son so that men might have life that believe in him, he says because the world will be judged. This condemnation means that one is in danger of being subjected to the eternal wrath of God. Romans chapter 118, Romans 2, 5 to 10 describes this just wrath of God that it will fall on those who have not been obedient to him. If you go to Romans 2, 5 to 10, we find that we're going to be held to the standard of Christ in verse 16. And it says that those who are disobedient, those who are rebellious, they're going to find nothing but wrath and indignation. For those who seek immortality by doing good, and that's not good according to our own thinking, but good according to God, will receive eternal life. Men condemn Jesus to death, and yet his death is for condemned men. His death was for those who put him to death. The death of Jesus Christ accomplished the justification for man to be saved. It says where that justification came from there in verse 9. Much more than having now been justified by his blood. Only in his blood is there that salvation from the wrath of God. The death of Jesus accomplished the justification for man to be saved. In the bruising and the breaking of his body and the shedding of his blood, he justified mankind. The fifth thing that we get from Romans chapter 5, 6 to 10 is there in verse 10. For if while we are enemies, we are reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Man is separated from God. There had to be a reconciliation. If there is no need for a reconciliation, it means we're not separated from him. We can go and look in Ephesians chapter 2, where verses 11 through 16 talks about the condition of one that is far away from God, that is not near. Reconciliation or reconciled means brought near. It implies a separation. If you talk about family members who were now reconciled, what did that mean before the reconciliation? They were separated somehow. So whether it was by distance, but usually we don't talk about reconciliation coming together from distance. We call that being re reunited, generally. Reconciliation, reconciled, means a relationship. It was separated. It was bruised. It was broken. And when they come back together, we call that reconciliation. They reconcile. And there's great rejoicing when our friends or our loved ones or our family members are reconciled. There was a reconciliation between man and God that could only take place in his blood. In Ephesians 2, 11 through 16, tells us the condition of one who is separated from God. Just to give you the highlights, it says, without Christ, without peace, without hope, separated from God by sin is spiritual death. Separated by God eternally is the second death. And we see this 
in 2 Thessalonians 1, 9 and Revelation 21, verse 8. Jesus Christ's death on the cross reconciled men who were separated from God, brought them near by his blood, and destroyed the enmity between God and man. It even destroyed the enmity, enmity between man and man. Jew and Gentile were reconciled together in his blood. So that Jew and Gentile could sit side by side as Christians in the church and call each other brother and sister. And there were, this caused great consternation, this amazing event. Go to Acts chapter 15 and see what was happening between the Jewish believers and the Gentile believers. There were some bumps in the road. But Jesus' blood made it possible to have Jew and Gentile call each other brother and sister. And finally, as we look in Romans 5, 6 to 10, we see the great love that Jesus had for men. Sin put him on the cross. Love held him there. It was for love that he went willingly and lovingly to the cross. That he took up your sin and mine and the sin of those putting him to death, the sin of mankind throughout time until he calls time no more. That he said they could be washed away in his blood. Read with me in, again in verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. It is only through Jesus, his blood, his sacrifice, and his love that we are saved from the wrath of God that was set to pour out on condemned men. The word love has been abused by many, but in scriptures it means something selfless. Agape means seeking the best interest of another. It is not just a warm, fuzzy feeling. Otherwise, we love could be defined by all kinds of things, because lots of things might give us a warm, fuzzy feeling. But love defined in the Bible, love defined by God, exemplified in His Son, is something that puts the best interests of the one you love at heart. That you're willing to even give your life for them. Husbands, in Ephesians chapter 5, we're told to love our wives the way Christ loved the church. Acts 20 verse 28 tells us he loved the church so much, he bought it in his blood. What Ephesians 5 is telling husbands is we need to be willing to give our lives for our wives. The same way Jesus gave his life to buy the church. God loves the world. He loves his creation. He provided the means for salvation despite the cost to his son. John 3.16, he gave his son, and as we talked about earlier, all that that contained in that little word, gave. On that day, God declared to the world, and Jesus himself declared to the world, I love you this much. As he gave his body, as he gave his blood, and as Luke 23.46 says, he breathed his last. On that day, darkness fell for three hours. The temple veil was torn in two from top to bottom. There were earthquakes, the rocks split, and the dead rose and walked into Jerusalem. You read that in Matthew 27, 45 to 54. Even the centurion standing guard realized this was no ordinary man. This was no ordinary death. This was not just another day of executions. But in fact, the centurion standing at the foot of the cross in Matthew 27, 54 said, Truly, this is the Son of God. Christ's death demonstrated the endless love of God for mankind. We know from 1 Timothy 2.4, 2 Peter 3.9, and Romans 8.32, God would have all men to be saved. He doesn't wish for any to be perished. Romans 8.32 says he provided the proof that he did not spare even his own Son so that you and I might be reconciled, you and I might be saved. In just a minute, we're going to sing Number 230, when I survey the wondrous cross. We're going to read, we're going to sing these words. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Does that not remind you of when Jesus quotes from the Old Testament and says, you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Jesus is saying, you need to love God with everything that you are. We're, just, we're about to sing these words. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Do you appreciate the sacrifice of Jesus? Have you shown your appreciation with obedience to his word? God's concern and interest for your soul 
should urge you to be faithful to him, to obey him and be faithful to him until death, that you might ever live with him. My admonition and encouragement this morning is let us always remember Jesus and his sacrifice. Let us make it a daily remembrance, not once a year, not just weekly even, we, but as weekly as we observe the emblems of the Lord's Supper, that we might never take that sacrifice on our behalf in vain. And if you're not a Christian this morning, you need to be. If you're not a Christian, you're still separated from God, and you don't have to be. He died that you might be reconciled to him in his blood. You can repent and be baptized into his name, rising from the waters of baptism a new creature, walking in newness of life. And if you are a Christian, not walking the way that you should, now's the time to recognize that and to do something about it, to remove that barrier of sin and be reconciled to God once again. And if we can assist you in these things, whether the prayers of the congregation on your behalf or the waters of baptism, come forward and let it be known now while together we stand.